Hello, hello, hello. Good evening. And welcome to another comedy intercourse tonight. Uh, we always aren't Richard. No, Richard. I'm sorry. He's, he's listening to comedy downstairs, actually. Thought he wasn't going to be here. Turns out he's just skiving off like the scoundrel he is. But it's all right, because what I have with me is the three parts man, one part terrifying biological automaton. It's Tim McConnell. Hello, Tim. Hello, hello. That is my favourite ever introduction. Thank you very much, Chris. <laughs> I spent milliseconds coming up with it right there. Well, it showed. Improvised. <laughs> In structure, in content, it was terrible. Oh, okay, um, so what we've got? We've got a bunch of TV to talk about. Uh, we've got a bit of. We've got a bit of. Uh, we're going to call it internet. It's vaguely. It's quite video gamey, which is exciting. We have actual news, um, a little bit of film, possibly, and some live comedy to tell you about as well. Uh, I think possibly we should say that if you're just listening to this and you're not doing anything. Uh, and you happen to be within 100 metres of us in the Union, you could go check out Milk the Laugh's Wit Tank Takeover, uh, which is pretty cool. Milk the Laugh's yeah, pretty cool, guys. It's where I wish I was. So. Yeah, it's what, we, it's what we wished we were doing, but we, uh, we agreed to do this, and that's what we're, we're going to do. <laughs> what terrible people we are. Um, and what a, a keen start to the show. What a keen well. start. I mean, if you want to tune out, make yourself a sandwich, uh, three three-course meal... Get some volivants for the end, you know, treat yourself and uh, come back. We won't have said anything by the time you're done making that. Uh, I, that's run, I think we'll run the competition quickly and get that started. If you want to join in, let's have a competition sound first. Oh, my God. It's time for the competition. <laughs> Time for the competition. Right. I mean, I, I feel that this uh, this is owed some explanation. Normally, uh, the show is hosted primarily by Richard. And what I do is I sort of sit at the side and make little comments and try and get attention, like the annoying kid at the back of the class. But this this mechanic is sort of ruined if I'm the guy hosting it. And then all these stupid bumpers that I made in five minutes with my own dumb voice... Um, Come across as deeply arrogant, don't they? Yeah, yeah. And the role of the little boy at the back of the class is taken up by me. Yes. And <laughs> but you... <laughs> I normally have like quite a, a low energy kind of voice, so it, it the dynamic sub... is struggling a bit. I think. Well, you're subverting the little boy as well, which is exactly what the annoying little boy would do. I'd be like, "Come on, little kid, do a joke or something." You go, "Nah, I don't, I don't like, it. I don't want to." Oh. <laughs> so the competition uh this week is i would like a joke which is uh, a knock knock joke i think and either the best or the worst knock knock joke i mean it doesn't have to be just put your best or worst joke and we will choose the best or worst joke that we're given and the winner of the best or worst joke it could be any as well let's be honest there's not a lot of take up on this competition so you could just put anything in and you might win two tickets to house of fun comedy on a thursday on the 21st which is exciting stuff Really, uh, some free comedy for you there, which you otherwise would have had to pay for with money or services or goods. So was... unless you're literally selling those knock knock jokes for money, services or goods, then yeah. it's a, it's a, it's a no brainer deal. Really. And if, also, if it's a really low quality knock knock joke, yeah. you could increase the value of it by getting these tickets. So you've bartered up essentially, yeah. and then you could trade those tickets for something else, and it'll be like, have you heard of the guy that traded all the way up to a Ferrari from a paperclip? Yes. Yeah. Uh... I mean, it took him a long time, and arguably in those man hours, he could have yeah made, st- stolen or, or earned the made, money for, for Ferrari. But. <laughs> you know, it was. I guess it was an experiment. Ironically enough, um, when he was given the Ferrari, all the papers of ownership just flew away because he had nothing <laughs> to keep them together, and he lost the Ferrari. It was deeply ironic. Um, yeah, let's let's get a little bit. I think we should go into the the TV the TV section here. I'm sort of pulling my head away and you shouldn't do that you shouldn't do that on the radio you should keep your head near to the microphone at all times if possible inside the microphone if you can live inside there is, is that a subtle reminder to me in my my poor radio it, technique it was me leaning away actually um <laughs> but it can serve as a reminder to you but you haven't done it yet not that i heard anyway so i'm i'm sorry tim i'm i'm really i'm, I'm coming across all authorial i'm used to just twiddling my thumbs and pinging gum into the hair of the person behind me so are you calling Richard a grumpy teacher? Is... I'm not. I'm not saying he isn't. If that's if you can follow, 
subtle. I, I like it. Uh, we we did actually used to call him in school. I knew him from school. Um, we used to call him the man with uh, the boy with the soul of a forty year old. <laughs> And we never found out where he got it, where he stole the soul from, because it can't be his own. Uh, but that's that's a bit of... He was actually horrible t- about me when I wasn't on. So I think I'm allowed to, guys. Uh, but, you know, if you if you feel I'm being unnecessarily nasty to Richard Ross, I'd say to you, shut up, Richard Ross. I hate you. <laughs> it's time for the TV section. It's uh, it's time for TV, I guess. Okay, I forgot I did that voice. I forgot I put a bit of voice modulation on. Uh, that was, by the way, the week Tim that I discovered audio effects on Audacity. It was a it that was also a... shows. Like... Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I'd like to talk first of all. I don't know whether you've seen these. Depending on whether you have or you haven't, depends how long we're going to talk about this. But um, it's a series of what is essentially pilots that BBC Three uh they paid for i guess uh and they're called comedy feeds and they're available on through iplayer on the the bbc3 website and it's quite they're quite nice because it gives you a, a sort of a petri dish of what is fermenting uh on tv comedy basically what could happen and the, there's a couple of shows that i i'd like to talk about um uh, one of them is kerry i don't know whether you heard of it tim i have not so pitch it <laughs> well kerry is a is a sketch show written uh and acted out, I guess, by uh, Kerry Howard, who is related by being born by the same woman and man. Uh, no, the woman gave birth to her, but the man helped, I guess. He was there for moral support. Um, so, yeah, she's uh, Russell Howard's sister, mm-hmm. and she's got this this sketch show uh, called Kerry, and the, the pilot itself is only 15 minutes long, of which I think there is only about eight sketches, oddly enough. Um and so what you might be getting now, Tim, is sort of a feel for why I'm not too pleased with this. It's very little Britain. It's very little Britain. They There's a preponderance of people that want catchphrases. And some of these really long sketches are actually just catchphrase sketches as well. There's someone who which is, says they were really nasty to Laura or something. They were really nasty. First one, she's in a club or a pub and uh, someone's nasty to this woman that she's friends with and she sort of clucks around as this terrifying peacock going they were nasty i hate it and she just ruins everyone's night and forces you to leave and this character is transposed into several humorous different places uh one of them was a funeral hotbed for comedy is funerals uh as anyone that watches any comedy will know uh, well, someone's they're, yeah they're someone's gonna ruin <laughs> someone's gonna ruin a funeral it's just it's gonna happen <laughs> Um, another one was a meeting between aliens and races, and she sort of saunters in in a spacesuit and goes, they were nasty, and ruins the first contact between extraterrestrial races. And I was a little irritated because what it had was, as the first one, uh, a particularly unfunny version of this sketch, because the sketch is the character who's always really insulted for her friend, the friend who says nothing and then leads them away. But the first iteration of this was just... It was just a friend. It was just a normal event. It wasn't particularly weird, other than her overreaction. I think you, I think you're being harsh. They've got very little time to set up this catchphrase comedy. But uh... they spend a good like minute or so. I mean, it it probably won't feel like it. But the thing about it is, it all takes time. Someone's edited this. Someone's had a look at it in its entirety, and they just throw this away. And they could have, you know, cut it down, had a couple of extra sketches. So I found it very sort of fluffy. Can I say fluffy about comedy? Well, I mean, pre-Watershed, maybe not. No. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I would say it was a comedy marshmallow, okay? It was, you know, it had... It filled out the shape, but if you were... And maybe if you put it in a microwave, it would look bigger uh, because of the heat expanding the air inside of it. But otherwise, I felt there was very little bang for your buck in it, which is, I, I think, a shame. They had a couple of nice ideas, but I think otherwise it was it was wasted... And they probably shouldn't have bothered. And so the the, the second one I want to talk to you about, Tim, is uh, Nick Helm's Heavy Entertainment. And I don't know whether you've heard of Nick Helm. I have heard of Nick Helm, but not this show. Well, that's good. Um, uh, here's my, my introduction to Nick Helm was through this. So I'd like, well, could you tell me how you know him? Uh, I saw his show 
a couple of fringes ago. Mm, so. Yeah. It came across from what I was seeing as originally a stage show, and I don't think it was, um, but he definitely had that sort of... He knew what works on stage, he knew what works live, and a lot of it was him reacting to live things. And I don't know how much that relates to your experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he was good like, at that. <laughs> so, so yeah, what, what, what did he do when you saw him? Probably better talk about what he did in the show, because it was a while ago when it was only like a clip in, a, oh. in an evening of... Of, All right. So of comedy, I remember more. So probably that that might reflect my feeling of his quality. Oh, uh, well, I I thought it was it was very brave what he did. It was. I mean, he sort of said that he was going to bring back entertainment, and I always like people failing to be light entertainment. I'm a big fan of shooting stars and the stuff that Vic and Bob do with it. And in fact, if they could just bring back shooting stars and uh, not not lucky sexy winners, Channel Four, that was bad. It's, I don't know why they just they didn't do it properly. But anyway, I, so he came out, and what it was is he starts off very flashy, has very high production values, has props coming down, and then slowly the show unravels. because And it's revealed to be a ploy to get his girlfriend to love him again. But his girlfriend didn't turn up for the show, I think. And um, so he has to get this audience member in and goes on a pretend date with her and stuff, and he reads this this achingly painful poem. And it, it's straight into anti-comedy as well at times, where he's just... He's genuinely reading out this depressing poem, ending with him in brown wife fronts on his knees. Pardon me. On his knees saying, I'm naked, I'm unarmed, please take me back, please. And then at the end, he sort of saves the show with a, a musical number and then gets put back in a car and driven off. And so it was, it was a really exciting experiment. I think I do like the sound of that, and I like the sound of what BBC Three are doing as a whole here. The, the concept does. I, yeah, I, I loved it good. as well. I, c- I couldn't find myself hating anything that was put on there, just because people sort of were going, "Yeah, I'll try this and I'll try this," and they did feel a bit experiment. Well, Kerry didn't feel experimental; it felt formulaic and forced. But Nick Helms' heavy entertainment did feel very experimental, and I think it was an experiment that failed because it didn't convey what it would have been like, you know, the, the chemistry, the fear of actually being in the room with the sweaty man that's shouting rather than on the other side of a screen. Does, it doesn't ever communicate, really. And no matter how much an audience member will grimace in a close-up, you're never going to communicate that. Um, but I thought it was an experiment that... It was, it, it was good to watch, right? In the same way that a fire is good to watch sometimes. Not as good as a real fire, but... Yeah, yeah. A, t- a television show just for fire possibly wouldn't work as well uh, as as an actual fire, as an actual fire. in terms <laughs> of keeping you warm probably for the same reason this show didn't work so well like they're just you're never going to transfer that yeah. feeling <laughs> so all all you television programmers who are putting out just fire just shots of bonfires and so stop it we're sick of it well, that, that actually is a show in norway that's um, that's beautiful <laughs> quite a popular one um so that's I think that says more about Norway than it does about television programming, though. They're just amazed by it. What's this? This is great. Well, I, what I'm... is this accent? I don't know. I've been watching fire all day. I'm amazed by Norway in general. So, just... <laughs> What is it about Norway that amazes you? you you've asked at an unfortunate time. Um, because literally <laughs> the, m- most of my week has been taken up in the most unfunny pastime of watching the World Chess Championship live. And... <laughs> Surely, the trans- surely from a you know a, a person looking outside, that's quite funny. You watching chess live? Yeah, for literally five and a half, six hours a day. So um, who won? Who was the? Well, it's an ongoing champ. It's, it's still it's going the, on. It's the world championship. Oh. so it's twelve games. Uh, that's quite it's quite long as well because some of them go on for a long time as well. Oh yeah, there's a lot of beard stroking and prepondering. Well, you s- and... you say beard stroking, but the the challenger. Uh, is a young Norwegian oh. who's t- only 22 years old, and I, my money is on him. You, th- you think Magnus he's gonna... Carlsen? Yeah, Magnus a... Carlsen is the guy. So, if listening in, <laughs> if you want a safe bet for the Norwegian Chess Championships, Magnus Carlsen, you heard it here first. And that's obviously a lot of our listeners were looking for that tip. Well, um... yeah, I mean, I've I've got uh, I have my whole life savings <laughs> on this match. So if Magnus doesn't make it, uh, it's checkmate for me in the job market. <laughs> My credit rating is down through the floor, which will also be where I'm living in a in a basement. So yeah, um, I do. I like. It's been televised, right? They've televised 
Well, it's on like live online on like all of the same websites that usually like have computer games live online. They've just put chess on. Yeah, which I guess that, that, that's cool. And I guess the the one of the things about a broadcasting a computer game is that people are already willing to say, "I'm not going to get the full enjoyment that this was designed to <laughs> from playing it." So I'm just going to watch it and possibly learn. I guess yeah. is part of the joy of it. So that, that's pretty cool. That's that's really cool. <laughs> Um, I feel that we've gotten off topic, though. Um, so anyway, Magnus Carlsen, check him out. Um, you were telling me about a, a remake by Miss Messrs. Jones and Palin. Yes. Uh, way back in the 60s, they did a series for the young channel ITV uh, called The Complete and Utter History of Britain. Who are they? Never heard of them. <laughs> uh, it was in black and white. It's extreme. It's so dated. Uh, and ITV just got rid of or sold or reused most of the tapes for it. That's that's heartbreaking as well, because you hear that about so many great shows. Yeah. <laughs> and to hear that they've, you know, unless someone vhs it. Did they have VHS then? I don't know. They might have all been on too much LSD to really figure out video. Yeah, I mean, everyone on the 60s, in the 60s. <laughs> on, the 60s. <laughs> on the 60s. They were on the 60s in LSD. <laughs> it, was a, it was a rough time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was beautiful. <laughs> yeah um, well they're remaking the show uh for for dv for dvd they're going to reshoot some stuff use some original footage uh i would ha- there's a few clips on youtube a few rare clips that you can check out and it is potentially extremely funny it's kind of like terry jones doing like history comedy which he came back to later in his career yeah uh I, th- I kind of feel that as well, Jones never really got the success that he deserved for what he worked on and stuff. He sort of went behind. I mean, I know he wanted to be a director, but um, I-, I was saying to you before the show that Palin and Jones are by far the best Pythons. Yeah, I mean, ripping yarns. Ripping yarns, beautiful. yeah. Um, just in terms of what they produced as well, I think some of my favourite sketches were done by them. And I- everyone that loves Cleese is a popularist, and you probably support <laughs> Chelsea and only eat ready salted crisps. You dull, boring, boring people. I hate you all. That's quite a quite a Cleese esque rant there. <laughs> yeah. Ironically <laughs> enough, maybe I see too much myself in angry hotel owners. Um Yeah, that's again, I, I read um I read Palin's biography of the Python years when I was on holiday. And it was really long as well, and it was really cool, uh just sort of inhabiting this this world that they sort of the Pythons found themselves in. Uh, but also it, it detailed uh, the making of the Holy Grail and Life of Brian, which was very, very cool to sort of see how it came together and almost didn't come together. Um, so I'd recommend reading that if you, you are a big Python fan, because you literally get him mentioning, oh, Cleese and Chapman came in with this sketch about a uh, um, about a stoning, and we all laughed ourselves silly. And you go, I know that sketch, and you sort of... You find out how it all came together and also how it all fell apart as well, how dysfunctional the Pythons were. Because I think we, we sort of look back on it quite rosily. But... Well, inevitably, really. Like... Yeah. <laughs> but these were these were comedians at heart and therefore comedians don't get along. They're, all of them want attention. All of them want money. And they can't all have it. Yeah, I mean, comedy sock is, is it's, yeah. unmanageable. We're, we are, uh, for, the, for the listener's benefit, we are both members of comedy sock. And our meetings resemble more organised heckling, really, of basically whoever has the audacity to take control, basically. And then, um, as a result, we have very little real leadership because uh, the people that actually organise stuff just organise stuff. And then anyone that tries to direct the meeting in any way is undercut. We're just sort of chopping down the chair legs of those who would sit above us. So basically you're saying we are the new Monty Python, is what you're saying there. I, I would say Arrogantly. that we're, we're a bunch of backstabbing, um, deeply evil people. Uh, I wouldn't say the same of Python, purely because Palin was in it, and everyone knows he was lovely all the time, always, and he never did a bad thing once, except for when he sneezed on an old lady on the bus and didn't cover his mouth, but that was the one bad thing Michael Palin did. I have a I have a Terry Jones related story to me personally. Oh wow, uh, wow, 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 wow! My my girlfriend's dad went to the same school. Oh wow! Uh, and at slightly different times, but then when Terry Jones was back in the area, he wrote a letter to the school 
saying, oh. I was sitting on a bus and there were two boys from this school uh, and they gave up their seat for an old lady and they were very kind. And I must say that the standards of rude and disgusting behaviour have dropped significantly <laughs> and that would never have happened whilst I was a student. Oh, <laughs> that's lovely from Terry Jones. Yeah. Oh, um, I, have a, I have a very similar story. Um, I went to the same drama group as Cheryl Kill. They had a picture of her on the wall. She was Tweedy at that point. (laughs) Well, she was like the the god of that drama group, the Stalin of that drama group. She was sort of... We we saw her as something of a pariah, really, (laughs) by achieving success and not giving us any success. Us being 13, 14-year-old amateur dramatics people. Deserving of success. Deserving of all the success. (laughs) Totally not egotists at all. Just had a lovely little picture of her, and they'd mention when she was there. It was a pretty good. It was a pretty good group, but uh, we never really had any. We didn't have the chart success that Cheryl managed, largely well, because we released no pop singles at all, well, and all of my attempts to do so were shot down. You weren't crowd pleasers. I mean, you never. You stuck to your principles. You can't say the same for Cheryl. Uh-huh. <laughs> Those 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 heady days when Cheryl <laughs> burst onto the music scene preaching true love, the um the industrialization of our agriculture and collectivization of our assets, and then she sold all those away for power. Uh, you're you're the you're the Trotsky of, of drama. <laughs> and and Cheryl Cole is the Stalin. Is yeah. That, you're reaching for that metaphor. I don't think you've quite hit it. No. Uh, <laughs> For multiple reasons, possibly why also I'm deeply unsuccessful. But yeah, uh, Cheryl, if you're listening, just, just just remember who you used to be. Remember those days. I didn't actually go to it at the same time as her as well. I assumed not. I just saw a picture of her and they went, oh yeah, Cheryl went here. I'm like, Cheryl? Yeah, they went, Cheryl Curl. But she wasn't Cheryl Curl then. She was Cheryl Tweedy. Always elongated vowel sounds with you, Cheryl. So um, anyway... <laughs> Um, I think we need to have a break. <laughs> I think you need to have a break from our voices. So I'm going to put on a really cool song and you're going to listen to it and then we're going to come back and we're going to carry on talking for a bit. And that's how, that's how radio, that's how radio works. So <laughs> you're implying this is radio working. <laughs> <laughs> it's in its vaguest format. Yeah, it, it, it's, yeah, it's happening. Okay. You can't say it's working. What do you think of the show? Radio happened. It happened. It was there. Um, <laughs> we're positivists here. We can say it happened. Um, yeah. So see you in about 326. This is the Dirty Projectors with Gun Has No Trigger. <laughs> Yeah. 
Dirty projectors with the gun has no trigger. Ah, uh, what, what a funky song! I like how they combined voices and instruments. Um, I think a lot of music does it nowadays, and they were very brave not to try and do something new without voices, without instruments, just putting three minutes of silence out, which someone has done. Yeah, yeah, you know? three, I think, uh, John Cage. Very. Uh, I mean, it's not a particularly funny song, or even a particularly uh, good song. <laughs> masterful. Because I mean, if people started doing silence as well, we'd have to, we'd have to have a separate chart probably for just silent songs. And it would make for a different radio experience, certainly. <laughs> just, just, just silence. Just, just listen, just listen to it. That was some good silence there. There was some good. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like we've kind of sold out now by talking. <laughs> um... Yeah, well, it's like. I guess sort of 50% of anything you're listening to anyway has got, you know, all the spaces in between the beats because you've got the silence in between there. You could just cut out the beats. You don't need them. Just have the silence. It'll be great. We should... <laughs> this is an awful idea. Let's, let's, get on with, let's get on with the show. Um, we were talking a little bit beforehand. I'm going to talk a little bit now about Russell Brand's appearance on... It was Newsnight, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, an, it was a Newsnight interview. Uh, but it's also him editing the New Statesman, oh, which is what kind of sparked the yeah. whole interval. It's, you know, that's been the the, the leading thing. He's yeah. doing a big sort of rant piece. I mean, I, I want to say there was uh, there was furore, but there wasn't really. But basically, Paxman said he called him into his office. I think is how Paxman works. Mm. If you get an interview with Paxman, he's going, "You come in here, and I will I will talk to you." But why is it that I am talking to you? And then he asks you questions insistently until you break down. Um, you kind of set up a head teacher metaphor there, and I'm now going to make that a bit disturbing because I actually think there's a romantic there's a aspect to the the, the Brand Paxman duo. Because I, I felt that we we needed to connect it to what we were saying at the start because uh. the Paxman Bound relationship functioned very much as a headmaster and naughty schoolboy, and you'd see sort of. Um, Brand wheeling about in his little chair in the in the video if you've seen it and he sort of gets up and sort of says well you know comedy pretty cool through loo dooby doo <laughs> skiddy waddy waddy woo and then Paxman um, who I don't think is a musical man is a man to which levity and joy <laughs> is utterly foreign he deals in cold hard facts and if they're not facts he takes away points from your university um <laughs> So yeah, um, what did you think of it? I I found the level of of furore, as you say, a little bit surprising. Yeah, like, people got really into it. Really, yeah. Sort of... Literally, YouTube saw fit for the first time ever to send me an email <laughs> telling me that this was a video that existed. <laughs> like, I assumed, like it sends me some spam and stuff that goes straight into my folder. This like. Just went straight to my front inbox, like YouTube, Russell Brand, Paxman, you need to see this. Because, I mean, it does the same to me, but for cat videos, (laughs) um, there was a compilation of cat videos that got sent to my inbox. And I sort of looked at it and I went, this is a reflection on me as a person, but I still clicked on the link. I think we have catered, you know, slowly created very different user profiles on YouTube. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But, I mean, it, it came up, I saw it on lots of people's Facebooks. Everyone, I think what made it such a thing was that because Russell Brand was talking about, you know, important things from a position of effectively no authority, 
you know, he's he's not even a pundit. He was brought in to edit the newspaper as a guest editor, and then from that, it was like, okay, let's just get a person in. And then, so Brand argued from a position outside, you know, any sort of yeah. organized party or anything, um, which is quite nice as well because you, that's a that's a viewpoint you don't get a lot of on Newsnight because yeah, I mean, you hardly see any rich white people on the news. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> <laughs> I meant that they liked catering to sort of political. Yeah, yeah, it, it is a nice. Uh... And third voice well brand's voice was more of a apolitical view really was what he was saying was don't vote the system doesn't work let's just not use it until it falls to pieces as what i kind of got the the gist of his argument was and then every so often he'd do an exciting bit where he goes maybe we should have a revolution whooshin and um and then paxman go are you really saying this he goes well no but i can because i want to and what the people want and what the people are getting are two different things. Your impression has improved just dramatically <laughs> as over I the remember, last five minutes. As I remember what a London accent <laughs> sounds like. Um, uh, but yeah, so, I mean, as a, as a figure to be sort of um, attempting some sort of great wisdom as well, I don't think Brand is, a, is the voice of the people in any way. Yeah, I mean, he, he sees himself as kind of... Uh... Messiah figure. I feel. <laughs> that is literally what the name of one of his yeah. shows. Uh, so yeah, I don't think that we really should. I mean, as well, he <laughs> married Katy Perry and had all those pictures and stuff in America. And so basically, he's a proper celebrity. He's yeah. a celebrity for celebrity's sake. And I was talking to you earlier as well about how um, I feel a lot of his material works because of who he is, mm. rather than what he's saying. Which is you know fine and great. Individuality is a thing we should encourage and you know you want comedians to have a character but there's a point in at which um if what he's saying has no sort of transferable humor you need to ask is this a character act is this just a funny man and we laugh at what he's saying because we understand this is a funny man and that's what he does you know is he a clown essentially yeah i mean I've seen some some of his shows, and he has he has some material, yeah, but increasingly less, yeah, I as think. time goes on, and I, I guess it's also um, when comedians as a as a group uh, do think of themselves as a you know a small messiah often, and you do every so often get a comedian that sort of takes it on his. I mean, I'm thinking of Carlin, um, I'm thinking of Hicks. Yeah, I mean, those partly through the benefit of being Americans. Mm. Uh, and sort of uh, being of an age where maybe like things that they said that weren't so palatable to people weren't as yeah. instantly widely known. They, I think, were more successful than Brand, be- than Brand is. Yeah. Just yeah. because, I mean, if you re-listen to a lot of Bill Hicks material, like it's quite uncomfortable from like both from a modern comedy position and from like a modern left wing yeah. position. It's yeah. like, that's a bit. Like whenever people sort of go, well, it's common sense. I sort of go, oh, dear, this is quite scary because yeah. people go. Um, I'm thinking of like uh, Bill Burr has a, a very popular American com- uh, comedian. He has a bit where he goes. Um, uh, there's no reason to hit a woman. Of course, there's reasons to hit a woman. There's loads of reasons. You just don't do it. And he's sort of arguing this from a common sense point of view where he says there's reasons, but you don't do it. But that's not what people mean when they say there's yeah. no reason to hit a woman. They say you shouldn't do it because it's bad, basically. And he's sort of going, well, no, because linguistically that's not what you're doing. And it just comes across as quite you know, childish and weird. And I don't. So, yeah, the, the, the thing about as well comedians is that they have this sort of pariah status outside yeah. looking in. That means that they feel that they can talk about. And I think you have to have that status to sort of talk about stuff from a disassociated viewpoint to to pay attention to the humor of the system that you're in yeah i mean it's the magic chalk circle of the comedy yeah. medieval jester like you can say anything because you're not really part of the because, system because yeah so and i think that's why we get so many of them that think that they can sort of talk with authority about stuff i find that louis ck is rapidly becoming a sort a source of authority a sort <laughs> of this sort of oh common sense stuff and i guess um to people that don't, you know, feel that co- politicians don't speak to them, you know, you feel that they, they speak about the views of a type of person that they are not, I can understand why people will flock to an alternative figure and saying, this person speaks for me. And I think, so, 
I thought that the the choice of Russell Brand was really interesting for that reason, but possibly a bad person to choose because of his sort of celebrity and. Yeah, I mean, I think, in a way, it's interesting that they've chosen Brand, but there's, I think, they are better people they could have chosen. I mean, they are, they are comedians that do politics and yeah. that do politics really well and that do even do revolutionary politics, politics really well yeah mark Steele and mark thomas just to stay with the marks yeah um carl marx famously yeah. did the open mic circuit in london uh yeah. i mean he never he never got like loads of laughs but there was always like all the comedians at the back were going <laughs> collectivization yeah he, he was like a comedian's uh, yeah, socialist. Well, as well for socialists, he was a socialist. Socialist, like most yeah. people were like, okay, your ideas are kind of cool, but I mean, and he had this friend Engels that he sort of brought around with him as like a gigging partner, but wasn't really as popular as him. Engels sort of coasted yeah. on him. I mean, Engels is was widely renounced as a hypocrite in both com- comedic and Marxist <laughs> circles. Uh, they they wouldn't have him on at the comedy store and stuff because he kept on saying, comedy should be free, you shouldn't be coming and getting it from a store. Yeah, Stop when... disassociating yourself from the product of your labours, fool. <laughs> and he did own a factory. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... But, so... I... I... <laughs> I feel we've strayed slightly. We, we said this was going to get weird, and it has. <laughs> um, I, I sort of, I tried to put the the song not halfway through the show, in an attempt to keep it from getting weird. But we have talked so long that it was halfway through the show, and now it's weird. Now we've, now we've got weird. But we were making a point at some point, and the we, point we can was, blame Richard. Like... Yes, if he was here, none of this would have happened. Uh, we'd have just had a really dry show where we talked about our feelings and braided each other's hairs or something. I don't know. I don't know what he does. I don't listen to him when he's on the show. So uh, not we... not when he's actually, you know, doing it when I'm not on. I mean, like, when I'm actually in the studio. I've just got a different... My mic's hooked up to my iPod, and I just say <laughs> random words at intervals. Yeah, I mean, that is the impression I get from listening <laughs> to the show. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I assume that's what you've been going for. We could talk about other comedy in the news. Uh... Yes, uh, yes, I think that's where we were. That's where we were going. I just wanted to apologise for our, our little polemic there. But I, it's a comedy discussion show. I think we should discuss comedy on it as well as gibber mirthfully at each other. I think that's a word, gibber. 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 Yeah. So do you want to do you want to do your comedy news? Can I open with this one? Yeah, it's not yeah. Open take long. it. Open with that one. Because we were talking about. Tim was telling me about some some news that he found particularly comedic uh, in a very dark way. I think a lot of it's kind of schadenfreunde. Schaden, schadenfreunde. Sort of, oh, ah. And I sort of went on my BBC News app. And um, this has got the headline. It, uh, teenage, teenagers shock over body and well. Which starts off great like a, a lassie film gone wrong. But um, it's got the opening line. This is the sort of the byline this is what tells you why this is important okay so i'd like you to listen to why this is important a teenage boy who found a body in a well at a home in south london in a well at a home so it's a well in a home that's newsworthy on its own probably because fresh water isn't available in In, certain parts of london (laughs) that's true they just went and dug down and then it was a terrible disaster um has said he has found it difficult to sleep since finding it. So the news story is not the well and the body, but simply that this boy has lacked some sleep uh, previously, uh, you know, subsequently to finding a body. There you go, BBC News app, everybody. Um, It has a quote from him, which is simply, it had legs. (laughs) There you go. Educating the people. (laughs) Yeah, uh... In another segment that I'm assuming next week will have its own... Oh, yeah, this is going to have a bump. ...to be called, like, disturbing news that is <laughs> wrongly funny. Uh, <laughs> I, I have the story of um, the, the man that some of you may have heard of, some of you may be following the story, of a spy, so an MI6 agent, found yes. in, a, in a gym bag that was shut quite clearly from the outside. <laughs> uh, his death has been ruled an accident. So he, the body has been found in a bag... But it's, it's the news story at the moment as well as that it's the ruling. Yeah. Because before they'd been saying, oh, no, it was an accident. But it, the court still had to yeah. decide. But the court has went, nah, he probably used psychic powers to lock it. <laughs> I don't know. What, what did the court say? The court says it may seem unlikely, <laughs> but, 
but this is an accident. They may as well have said, <laughs> believe it or not, what a wacky world we live in. We're totally not being told by the government to <laughs> shut up about this and not investigate too deeply. I think we should go down and hunt down the truth. We're having quite a revolutionary episode. We're basically yeah. accusing the, the state and legal system of lying to us about something they're clearly lying about. Well, yeah, that's the thing. They're clearly lying. And they're just saying, no one's going to care enough to call us out on it. And we're calling you out on it, government. Government dogs, also cats, other pets. Government, we're calling you out on it. Because it's obviously he's been murdered. He's obviously been murdered. <laughs> Let's just say yeah. it. <laughs> Why are we not more bothered about this? That this guy's just been murdered in a really cool way, right? He's been locked in. This is like a Bond film. Why? I mean, we're going to get a we're going to get a TV adaptation in about 5 6 years. I'm expecting men to come through the door and shoot us right now, like <laughs> thereby increasing our listenership. For like a short while, we're actually going to have a listenership. There there's <laughs> <laughs> they looked for a moment there like a message was just going to come up yeah, I, on the I, chat box. I refreshed it to see if any government pigs were going to press the message. Well, going further down this rabbit hole of <laughs> funny police state news. Um, from the from the mother state. <laughs> yes. Uh, from Russia, there's the news that in an art protest, uh, an artist has nailed his scrotum to Red Square. <laughs> Um, his oh. his piece is cook. You see, you, you just you find that funny, and <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna. You see, we shouldn't, and it's quite bad that I've only heard about this through like funny news sources. Yeah, like because he's making a serious point. His piece is called Fixation. It's yeah. about apathy in the Russian political system. Yeah, and it... he's now just scrotum to Red Square. <laughs> <laughs> it's. I think what it is, is I mean, as a symbolic action, we all know someone that got nailed. It was Jesus. Yeah. And so there's, sort of, there's all sorts of ideas of perversion and rightness and wrongness going on in this. But the fact that he just nailed his scrotum, it's... I, I saw an interview with him and he answered the question, yes, it did hurt. Um, which shows you the kind of depth of interviewing that the Russian media has. Yeah. Uh, I mean... It's sort of it's very easy to dismiss this. I think is the problem. Um, so rather add than a sort of that's other symbolic gestures. For example, the the monks that set themselves on fire. Right, that is really hard. I mean, that, and it's iconic. I mean, they that's iconic. That's terrifying. There's something darkly comedic about because I sort of saw a picture as well, mm. and he was sort of like squatting as well. It's not a heroic pose. Well, there's, I mean, he didn't really have any other option of yeah, pose. True, like. true, yeah. Um, the, the elasticity <laughs> is very limited in that area. So there was, you know, there's only so much you can do. But blimey, it's like, it was not, it was not a heroic image, I think is the problem. I think he could have... that's the point. I mean... I guess I mean, you could say that's his point. You could say that's his point. And we are talking about it now. So it has in some small way achieved its purpose. <laughs> But I don't think he wanted us to be talking about it. I think he wanted, you know, major news to go, what the hell is this guy doing and why is he doing it? And equally, similar to the, you know, the monks setting themselves on fire, you have to admire his tenacity, basically, yeah. to just sort of say, this is what I'm going to say to you. Dink, 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 dink. And just sit there. Because someone had to, I guess, remove him. Yeah, right? he was arrested. Um, he was arrested. And it's difficult to move a man in that position. Also, um, uh, depending on how well he hammered it, it's difficult to get a nail out of something. Yeah. I mean, they'll have to get, like, a claw hammer or something. I mean, if it's anyone that's hammered a nail too far into something when, like, maybe making some IKEA furniture and had to pull it out, they'll realise the logistical difficulties <laughs> he put the Russian police force to. <laughs> Um, and it was police day. I mean, he chose his protest well. It was like a day where they basically celebrate I'd, I'd, the police. I'd like it if he was really scared and he did it on blood donation day, just in case. He was like, in case they have a really rare blood type, I'm going on the day when they definitely have some blood. And then they just take him in and they go, well, we don't have time to bottle it. We'll just directly siphon it over to you. What a, what a mad man. But well done, you. Well done, you. If he could nail himself to um, a luggage case to to bring up awareness of the guy that was obviously murdered, people. <laughs> Wake up, sheeple. He was murdered. Um, 
I think I'll get in contact with him, see whether he'll do that. See if we can... <laughs> He could be a guest. I mean, I mean, he must. If he lost enough blood, maybe he'll be dumb enough to come and guest on the show. If he's just still like slightly anemic, he'll just be like, "Oh, okay, I'll do it." <laughs> I'm obviously up for anything. Let's go. This, this guy is Norwegian now. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my anemic Norwegian voice. What are you gonna do? <laughs> oh, heavens to Betsy. Um. I think uh, it's time to move on onwards uh, to internet-y stuff, which I think we can have about five minutes of, and then we'll talk a bit about live commodity. Um, so you wanted to talk a bit about, actually, actually, do we have a bumper? I think we do. <gasps> oh, blimey, it's a bumper. Get ready. Yeah, bumper, bumper. <laughs> My liege, it appears to be time for the internet section. Well, go on then. Do it. There we go. That's the uh, that's the full one as well. Richard never leaves it on for the well, go on then, do it. Because really arrogantly, I thought he's going to be in so much hysterics that he's not going <laughs> to turn it off. And then eventually my voice is going to come in and remind him to do the show. And it'll be really funny, but he never... Is that why you put me on the other side of the desk? So I can't possibly... <laughs> so you can't stop me, yeah. <laughs> Just get it off! Get this awful sound, you arrogant fool. Um, so, yes, you want us to talk about Mr. Anthony Butch, who I feel yes. fits in the internet section. Yeah, I mean, you That's were... where he made his bread, I yeah. guess. You were discussing Hey Ash, What You Playing, mm-hmm. uh, which is his web series. Uh, he also is kind of... I, f- I feel really talked in an eloquent and precise way about game mm. comedy yeah this hasn't really been done that well before like video games are just funny like a lot of the mechanics of video games make them funny to play yeah uh they either make you sort of like ridiculously powerful which is kind of funny uh or they subvert that and make you kind of flimsy and difficult and awkward yeah like quop yeah, um, uh, which and is also, also funny. And also sort of Mario as well is yeah. an inherently... Video games are inherently surreal, I guess, yeah. is what, what you're saying. They're very weird, and you're surprised that not more has been done with them. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of particular, like, comedy games that I wanted to mention. Uh, the simulator games, mm. Train Simulator. Yeah. Right? There's no reason on paper why this sh- these games should be funny. But they really are. There's, there's a yes. It's sort of the, the earnestness of Train Simulator, <laughs> uh, the fact that if you if you don't realise, um, it costs at least three hundred pound to get all of the trains on it. Yeah. If you wish to simulate, for example, the Mallard, you have to pay extra money for that. Um, I had a friend who uh, tried to run a commercial rail line while I was just talking to him on Skype, and. Um, for about 20 minutes, he just said nothing about it. And then he went, oh, no, I missed my deadline and crashed my train. <laughs> Which, it, it's a very interesting thing. Yeah. And then Surgeon Simulator, which is the perfect crossover game between Quop yeah. and the earnestness of the simulator games. Quop, uh, for people uh, that don't know, is a game where you control individually the limbs of a runner. Yeah, and, and it is so difficult, it's hilarious. It's it's very physical, the, the comedy as well, because this, this body is flailing around and contorting in weird ways. And it's sort of, it's quite cool because it makes you think, well, actually, this is really cool how we can actually use our bodies. <laughs> Similarly, Surgeon Simulator has got the same sort of physical comedy You've got this clumsy hand, and you've got to perform this really clumsy surgery on this 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 body. Um, it also uses the uh, Holby was it Holby City? Yeah. Um, soundtrack, <laughs> which is a brilliant like yeah, controvert like uh, contrast of tension to actual atmosphere of the game. It's a, it's a very sort of electro music is also sort of associated with technological yeah. prowess and things being done well, and then sort of to associate it with this just hands just slapping at an open brain. Is quite my favorite series of uh, YouTube videos is a how to basic where a guy I think he's jumped the shark at this point, but um, where a guy just sort of from first person viewpoint, you just see his hand badly make food and he's just like hitting a salmon or he's just flushing a steak down the toilet and he's just smashing eggs. <laughs> and there's a glee, uh, the same glee that you got from Bodger and Badger when you were a kid of just 
food being squished and this sort of very tactile sort of comedy um which is which is cool yeah and then a game that i downloaded today and have been playing all day is octodad octodads because i heard i heard about octodad a while ago and i was excited it is brilliant the whole concept is you are an octopus (laughs) But you want... Famed for the mimicry. <laughs> yeah, but you want to masquerade as a loving <laughs> father. Um, and you love like you love your kids and your wife genuinely. And it has this wonderful mix of being about like clumsy physics. Yeah. And also about like imposter syndrome and like feeling like you don't really belong. Yeah. It's kind of a, a misanthropic game. That... It's it's deeply surreal as yeah, well. There's a it sort is. of Yeah, and it's it asks you sort of to sort of put yourself in these ridiculous shoes. And by putting you in ridiculous shoes, you realise what colour your normal shoes are. Yeah, and it's, it it's throws... very difficult to fit, like, four limbs yes. into shoes. That's one of the things you find out playing the game. Well, I mean, I guess he's got the two tentacles of that masquerade as a fatherly moustache. Um, and then he's got at least some... I think it's two for yeah. each. One, one each arm, and then he's got his two... Oh, so it's two, yeah. So there's a, there's a sort of... There's an ungainliness to it, which is very, I think, uh, endearing. I mean, if, pardon me. If I ever saw uh, a cephalopod masquerading as a family member, I wouldn't. I wouldn't call it out. I just. I'd accept this. I think that's that's sort of the the message of the game is that yeah. clearly they all know. Yeah. I mean, but they just love them. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, you do. That's beautiful. Um, so I think finally uh, we're running out of time. So we're going to talk quickly about. I kind of wish I hadn't put the, uh, <laughs> the long one. <laughs> oh, 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 God. Oh, jeez. Oh. It's time for Leeds comedy. I mean, I mean, even me overacting there just reflects badly <laughs> on me mm-hmm. now. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to, to mention some of the comedy that's going on. Milk the Last Wit Tank, uh, I would have told you about, but it's on now. And it will be over soon. So hurry up if you want to go to that. Uh, there's a pigeonhole coming up on 8th of December. I've been told to tell you about the old pigeonholes. Uh, previous guest, John Newell, will be on there. Staple slash face, exciting sketch group slash human beings will be on. Um, can't remember who else is on, because I don't have the leaflet with me. For £2, does it matter? Yeah. Like- Two pounds. I will go. <laughs> one of the yeah, one of the, the the best value comedy nights. Similarly, good value is House of Fun, which is coming up. Uh, we we talked about. We tried to give away some tickets, uh, and no one, no one tried to get the tickets. So you don't get the tickets. Well done. Um, okay, so no one came there. Uh, that's Rob Rouse, who uh, used to own a duck. So if that's not going to sell you, so what we're going to do, quickly head off. Thank you for listening, guys. Uh, we were comedy intercourse. <laughs>